Good evening once again to all of us on this call. I think that um, in the interest of time, uh, because we want to have this session within an hour, um, we want to make a start now whilst we um, allow our colleagues to join while the session is ongoing. Um, I welcome you to today's time with chapter members. I think we've been um, advertising this program for some weeks now, about two weeks. And we are glad that you've taken time off your busy schedule to join this evening's schedule and program. Uh, my name is Patrick Barbanqua. I'm head of member experience, regulations and business development at the Institute. And I'll be your moderator for this evening's session. Before we go into the discussions, um, we have the CEO of the Institute, Mr. Robert Jato on the call. Um, we want to invite him to give his opening remarks and comments, and then we'll move straight into the session with our two distinguished uh, members who are going to share um, issues relating to their career, um, some lessons for uh, young bankers on the, on the call, and how they see the industry going into the next five to 10 years. But before we do that, we want to, at this point, invite Mr. Robert Jato, CEO of the Institute, to um, open the session for us. Thank you. Hello, sir. Hello, can anyone hear me, please? Hi, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can Hello, hear you sir. now. Yeah. Hello. All right. So, Hi, sir, um, first you. of all, um, thank you to everyone who has joined. Uh, thank you to our distinguished um, fellows and, and members, uh, and especially to Sina and uh, John for agreeing to this evening with us. Um, I have one request, please. We ask humbly that if you can extend the invitation to someone, uh, i.e. call share it on another platform, just to let people know that this event has started. And we are doing this as an institute to help our members. I'm sure if you look at the global market and what's happening, certainly John has a hands on um, dealing with all the volatilities and I am sure that we will learn something from him. The same way for Sina. Sina now manages one of the most systemically important uh, banks um, in terms of the consumer banking arm or the retail banking arm. And I think there's so much to learn. So please, by all means, extend this invitation to someone to join us. And, and that's a humble uh, request. Otherwise, I'm here to learn. And uh, as an institute, we are determined to make sure that we don't just pass exams, but also we have the practical insights from people who are leading and making a difference in our industry, and so we can learn from them. Uh, on that note, um, thank you once again, Sina, John. Thank you, uh, Patrick and, and, and others. And thank you to everybody who has joined us this evening. I'll hand over uh, back to you, uh, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. CEO, for the opening remarks. Um, with the opening remarks done, we will now want to zoom into action. Um, so tonight we have two of our distinguished members um, on the call to share um, their insights, experience over the years uh, with us. Uh, we have Mr. Sina Kamagat is the executive head of retail banking, GCB Bank PLC, with us on the call. He is going to share some experience with us. And then we also have Mr. John Ziga, who is the director of global markets for CBG, um, also on the call. Um, the, the discussions or their presentation will focus on their um, career journey, um, some challenges that they face in their career and how they overcame them, um, some milestones that they want to share and which became turning point in their career. 
they also give us some advice and mentorship um, ideas for our young bankers. Then also share some insights on work-life balance and then some ethical dilemmas that they face and how they, they dealt with them um, whilst rising in their career. Um, each of our distinguished um, speakers will have about 15 minutes of presentation. And then when they are done, we'll open up for questions and some uh, answers from our speakers. We hope to do that within 20 minutes. So we have 15, 15, 20 minutes and some final remarks from our speakers. So I want to, first of all, invite the first speaker by reading a short profile of him. So the first speaker for this evening is Mr. Sina Kamagati. Um, he, he was appointed executive head retail banking at um, GCB Bank PLC um, this year, January 2024. Before his current role, he was the chief internal auditor of the bank and he actually joined GCB in 2020 with over 15 years um, experience in key areas relating to banking. His experience, as we all know, cut across finance, treasury, trade finance, external audit, assurance service, internal audit, internal control, among others. He started his uh, career with GCB as an intern and subsequently as a national service before he moved to International Commercial Bank, now FBN Ghana, and left after two years to Ernst & Young Chartered Accountant, where he worked in the financial services team. Um, uh, there are a number of things that I can say about um, his working life, but I guess he's going to mention some himself and give us some of the dilemmas that he went through. But he's a chartered accountant, a chartered banker, and a fellow of the Institute, a chartered information systems auditor, and holds distinction in ICA operations. Uh, his main subject um, area or areas is the finance of international trade, IFRS, treasury management, internal control, auditing, and risk management. Um, he lectures in risk management, corporate governance, and treasury management, and is a council member of the Chartered Institute of Bankers and chairs the finance committee of the outgoing council. On that note, I want to invite Mr. Sina Kamagati to give us his, his perspective and talk about his journey at this point. Good evening, Mr. Sina Kamagati. Please confirm if you can yeah. hear me. I can hear you. I don't know if you can. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, good evening, uh, Patrick and everybody on call. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you on a Friday evening uh, when everybody is exhausted. Um, but some of these uh, interactions are important to um, share our own experiences and more importantly, contribute to knowledge in the industry. Of course, um, we've gotten here, not just by might, but because we have had the opportunity of observing um, from afar how some people um, have lived their life in the career settings. And so if today CIB has put together a platform for us to share our experiences with colleagues, then obviously um, we would uh, run at that opportunity and, and, and share. And so uh, to start with, I'm happy to be here and I hope the lessons I share uh, helps everybody on the call in shaping your career uh, to the top. And more importantly, the feedback I would also receive from you all uh, would be the type that can also project my uh, journey as uh, I have a lot of years to serve in the, in the industry. I think I, uh, uh, by 28 of this month, I would have some 18 months, uh, 18 years more to serve in the industry. So there's still a lot more to learn uh, whilst we, we serve Mother Ghana. Yeah. And so, uh, Patrick, I don't know uh, how the session has been put together. Is it going to be question and answer or what's the format? Yeah, so you you will give us your, your 15 minutes um, journey, the experiences, and then when you are done, um, we invite Mr. Zigat to also do so. Then when 
he's also that we open up for questions from um, our audience our members uh, and that's where if a question comes to a particular area you may want to delve deeper in, into that okay so um let me start with the career journey i, I must say that uh, my presence in gcb now is actually a payback to a bank that took care of me whilst i was whilst i was in school and so since level 200 i've always had the opportunity to do some internship uh, program with uh, gcb and particularly uh, I, I i mostly was taken to the finance department uh, where i was involved in reconciliation and other related activities and so uh, when i completed uni i got the opportunity to do my service with uh, gcb whilst doing this service um i had my I had my eyes on other things and so um in july you know you service service normally ends in july in july i have this very good friend uh, may he so rest in peace and 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 he is uh, dombo dda dombo uh they don't don't go he looked at me one day and said look Sina, i i think you need to go outside even if gcv gave you the opportunity don't take it go outside and then go and look for jobs so he took my cv and then uh, presented it at international commercial bank now they call them fbn and they called me for the interview i went through the interview and then uh, they picked me to their finance uh department so on the day i reported that's very fresh on the um on the fourth or on the fourth of september uh, 2009 when i reported they told me they had some challenges in the trade department and so i should go to trade i i started there whilst there i i was doing my acib and and um i i i am there I, I can say that I'm one of the people who started the current model, which we are about to phase out. And so I was writing, but it looks like for some reason, the rate at which I was passing, the Institute wasn't ready for me. And so uh, I, I remember at the time I finished level two, they didn't have any lectures for the level three courses. And so you go to the Institute, you want to register and they say, we don't have lectures here, blah, blah. So, um, I had to go and register for CA. And uh, so I registered for uh, CA. And uh, in one year, I chatted after I got um, level one and two exemptions. So I had only eight papers to write. In one year, I finished the CA. And CIB was still not ready for me to, 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 to finish my uh, ACIB uh, course. And so when I, when I, when I wrote, um, CA and finished, I told myself, look, Sina, you have CA, you are going to finish ACIB. And you have barely done two years in banking. The qualification and the experience are kind of uh, disproportionate. And so I needed to do something. And I said, look, let me go to Ernst & Young. I took my CV to Ernst & Young. They were doing their entry level recruitment at the time. And so uh, I went through the aptitude test and, and, and passed, went through the interview and passed. And at this point, I want you to note that in life, you need to make sacrifices uh, if you have a, a view of the bigger picture. And so at the time, young banker, if I put everything together somewhere in 2011, I was returning home at the end of every month, some 2,500 Ghana cities. Then Esther Young gives me my appointment letter and the amount written was 847 or 49 Ghana City. So just do the mathematics. Somebody who was enjoying bank loans, subsidized rate and all that, Esther Young said they will give me 847 or 849. Look, that's the most difficult decision I've had to take in my life. And at the time, it wasn't as if I was a, or, 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 or alone. I mean, I had my younger brother to take care of. I had some other people I was taking care of. And even with the bank money, son of man was struggling. So it wasn't easy, but I finally mastered courage and then took the job. And so I went to Ernst Young. Um, on that salary, 
after my first job, and I remember very well, my first job was HFC Bank. I was given all the subsidiaries of HFC as the team lead. I hadn't done audit before, so come and see banker leading a team. It had to take a lot of learning to finish that engagement. After the engagement, the HR called me one fine afternoon to her office and said, Sina, I think we under 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 valued you. You are worth more than we, we paid you. And so after that uh, engagement, I was promoted two places up. And so from an audit assistant straight to, we used to call it, I think, senior one, associate senior one or so. Um, and so uh, after that, I think my salary normalized and there were some coins uh, in excess of what I was taking in the bank. And so I did uh, some two years with Estelle, just when I was about doing two years, we had a job with a client and uh, because of my banking background, I was always on the uh, bank job. So they called me to go and do a uh, loan book review. So I went to do this loan book review. And after my conversation, the finance director of that bank said he wasn't going to let me go back to Ernst & Young and that I should quote my price. And I mean, some of you who know me, you know, on a good day, I like to flex. So I told the man that, oh, you can't pay me. Forget about it. You can't pay me. Then the man said, just call it. So one afternoon, Charlie, they brought me an offer letter. One of the allowances alone was almost higher than <laughs> what I was taking in Esther. Yo, I remember, and that was rent. They were going to pay me a rent, monthly rent of $720. That is scatter my mind. So I had to take on the job. So I went to um, uh, Fidelity Bank as the, so initially they interviewed me as head of uh, performance, financial performance. Just when I entered, they said, look, we are struggling in our audit, so go to audit. So I went to audit. And then I did, just when I was about doing two years in audit, UMB was um, actually a, uh, 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 um, going through some reorganization. And so the CEO then uh, heard my name and called me that he wanted me to write a concept paper for them around their risks and control environment. So I did a paper. I went to take them through um, and, and told them that whoever they employ, I am happy to help the person. Then they threw the question at me. Why wouldn't you come and do it? I said, oh, I was working on a project with Fidelity, so I can't uh, 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 leave the project in the middle. Again, they also showed me figures that I couldn't resist. And I felt more importantly, uh, in order not for them to think that I'm a, a, a theory a theory man, let me go and, 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 and do that. So I went to UMB, I think 2014. Uh, 2014, um, I was, um, I was just, 32 years going into merchant bank that, if you like, a traditional bank. And, and I, I remember on my grade, I was the youngest on my grade. And you were doing a major transformation. So there is when I learned all the maturity that you need, especially when it comes to emotional intelligence and how to actually work with people uh, to get to your destination. And so we worked beautifully with uh, um, the, the, the colleagues. That's when I made my friend, Mr. Ricotti. Most of you will know Mr. Ricotti. Uh, Mr. Ricotti, if you know him, is very knowledgeable in, in banking and, and, and finance. And so people went to Mr. Ricotti with a lot of caution. But uh, as stubborn as I can be, sometimes uh, we were in a management meeting and I challenged him. The whole room went quiet. And that's when we became our friends. So I learned a lot from that man. And up to today, I still uh, 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 learn from, from him. So I did four years in UMB. I think UMB uh, until now is the organization where I have spent uh, more than uh, three years. And so one fine day, I got a call from Fidelity Bank again. Uh, they had called me once to come and set up their internal control, which I, re I, 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 I didn't take up the challenge. But on this very call, uh, they wanted me to come and 
help uh, restructure the internal audit department. So I went there again. Uh, just when I was about doing two years, GCB came knocking. I went through the assessment and then I, I was successful after uh, going through about uh, six months of uh, interview session. It all started with PWC, where we were about 10 applicants who went through the presentation, the rigor. I was shortlisted in the top four, top three, who went to meet the board again and blah, 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 blah. And then somewhere November 11th, 20, 2019, um, I was uh, appointed, but I had to go through fit and proper persons processes. And so by uh, April, they had completed and I started work in GCB, April uh, 2020. This year, January, um, I was I was there minding my business and people were calling me, bra, 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 only for me to go and check my mail to see that the board of um, GCB had appointed me as the executive head of retail to go and transform the retail uh, function of, of, of the bank into a world-class um, um, retail function. And so that's what I've been doing from January uh, to now, and it's very, very exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it um, already. Now, in terms of challenges, eh, I mean, there are, there are real challenges that uh, I've had to deal with. And my challenge has always been around my age. I don't know. Sometimes I don't blame the people who who, who worry me around my, uh, my age. I just blame my father and, and mother for delaying in, in meeting to bring me to the world. And so one of the biggest challenge as I have faced has been around my age, where almost every major appointment I get, people keep bashing me around my age, around your age, around your age. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, when when you are making sense, and you know in Ghana, even when you are making sense, somebody goes like, "This small boy, you are too known. This small boy, you are too known." So it's a major challenge. But I mean, the challenge only I mean uh, humbles me, and it, it gives me that opportunity to show that age is actually a, a number. Uh, age is just a number, and and that um, it's got nothing to do with performance. That's my performance over the years uh, 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 have shown. And I can say that ever since I started working, um, I have never gone below um, a performance uh, score or balance score card score of four. And I can say that a lot of the time I get perfect score, that's five. I've gotten five a couple of times. And so that is a testimony that uh, it's about performance and not about uh, how long your appearance had to stay before uh, bringing you to uh, uh, the world. Now, um, any key milestones? Well, see, the key milestones that I, I want people to know is that in life, and, and there's a, a favorite, there's, I have a favorite uh, Arabic quote. Uh, it's a, an Arabic saying, which says that, man jada wa jada, man jada wa jada. And, and that means that whoever strives would, would succeed. And that has been my major motivation. Um, when I started, when I completed school, I was clear on my mind what I wanted to do. I did not uh, uh, miss that plan. I always make, made sure I followed the, the, the plan from day one. I knew I had to finish my professional courses. I knew I had to work hard. I knew where I am coming from. And so I was always led by um, 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 my background. And I remember um, how I even got my first car. I, I had gone to one of my godfathers to visit on a weekend. At the time, I was a chartered accountant, chartered banker, and all that. And he asked me where I parked. And I told him that I have bigger things on my mind than a car. And so that's how I got my first car. He took me to his garage and, and pointed a lot of cars and told me to pick one. So I chose a small one as usual. And that's how I got my first car. And ever since I got that car, I've never bought a car of my own. When I was going to UMB, they bought me a brand new car. Fidelity did same. GCB, I, I have my cars. And so 
uh, it tells me that in life you shouldn't be too materialistic and and be running at things the things that you want just work hard wish for them and they'll obviously uh, come your way look nothing happens uh by accident eh? nothing happens by accident i have been receiving mentorship right from when i completed uh, gss and i have been clear my first mentor was my mom my mom has always wanted me to be a banker and so i remember when 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 i was in gss my mom would hold my hand take me to the obwasi branch of gcb walk into the manager's office and go and tell the man this my son would be a manager a bank manager this my son will be a so growing up there hasn't been any profession that has crossed my mind if not banking so i remember when we were choosing schools uh for ss my mom came to our school and asked the teacher me bano dn or your betty my bank manager and that's how come uh, I, I i did uh, business in school and then i went to Legon to do uh i've got admission to do is it ba all those uh, history classical history religious but i completed with uh, a perfect grade score i think 4.0 i had almost all a's in all the courses i did and so that's how come i had to move uh to uh admin to go and do admin and uh, uh um, so since then i've had my mentors as i speak to you today i have about four different people i call and they guide me one of them is not in the country um for those of you who may know uh renee carayo is is is, is, is a senior uh, career coach and and i have another one also at the london business school where i did my executive business uh, 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 we, we we catch up. I give them an update on what I have done in six months, and they they, they 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 give me directions. And so, look, if you want to get to the top, start looking for mentors and coaches. The thing is not uh, accidental; it's not accident. You actually need to plan for it. Um, work-life balance. Uh, um, um, everybody who knows me on this call knows that I always walk around with my uh, football boots. So if the slightest opportunity I have, I will I go to play. In December, I like to travel to Takrade with my fa uh, my family to go and do anchors. I will go and dance. Me, my children, my wife, we dance. We follow the band, dance. When we have time, we travel out outside the country to go and and and, and enjoy ourselves. It's something that I consciously keep. And as you know, uh, my my people in Mamobi and Nima. Uh, Nima we are uh, on Fridays. I pass by, go and sit there. We we laugh. We get kebabs. We chill. I mean, it makes life uh, 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 interesting. I told my wife that uh, uh, the day I stop going to Zongo, I'll be reducing my age by about uh, 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 two years. Any day I stop going, I'll be reducing my my age on earth. And so, I was born in Zongo, grew up in Zongo, and so. I have to continue being in Zongo. So I always will go there. Now, ethical dilemmas. Look, if you are a profession and you don't face, if you are a professional and you don't face ethical dilemmas, then it means that you haven't been to the top, especially as an auditor. You will be involved in serious investigations and people call you into corners, give you money that your whole generation hasn't seen before for you to write the report in such a way that those who have been involved will not be implicated and possibly uh, uh, terminated. But one thing that has held me all through my life is that I was born into a single room where I saw my mom born into and so in terms of difficulties and in terms of everything, I've seen it before. I am here just by the grace of God. And that it is not by might that I have been here. So material things really don't move me. And like I tell my friends all the time, that I can actually survive on 300 Ghana cities 
a man, they go like how? I say, me, my favorite is to get, when I wake up in the morning, I just buy kinky. You know, the fancy kinky, the one that has the black this thing, I'll mash. I just drop ice block inside. Fortunately for me, I don't take sugar. I don't really like sugar. And then I can drink that one by the end of day. If I want to change inside, I can do Gary Sokis. I like to buy Gary Sokis. I can do it. I can eat why because you see, when we're growing up, you finish eating before you go and queue for your meat. So I can actually eat food without meat. And, and in my mind, I'm finishing the food to go and take the meat. When I finish, I just go and sleep. And more importantly, all the money I make, <laughs> I don't spend much. A lot of my money goes into philanthropy. A lot of my money goes into philanthropy. If you ask students who have struggled and come to my school, Sina Consult, I give them for free. There are students that I pay their uh, exams fee to go and write. Some of them come back to pay others. I dash it to them. And so there's no much that I need in life. And so no dilemma, especially if there is money involved. I can assure you that no matter how much the amount is, I will not get trapped. I will not get trapped. I have very good friends. If I don't have money, I can call. Uh, 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 I've seen one of my friends on the call, Abada. Anytime I call Abada that I don't have money, she will give me. So what's the point in uh, going to be influenced by money? So this is the little I want to share and to tell everybody that you should have a principle. You should have principles that will back you. And that if you have read Paul Coelho, uh, his book, Alchemist, Paul Coelho says that if you need something and you really want it, the entire world or the entire universe backs you and supports you to get it. And that is why I always say to myself, man jeda wa jeda, whoever strives will succeed. Thank you, Patrick, for the opportunity. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sina Kamagati. Uh, I've taken not more than, not less than about half a page in terms of the pointer that you, you, you've given this evening. And I guess when you get to the questions and answers, I will, I will um, ask a few and then open up for our members to also ask all the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we want to move to uh, Mr. Uh, John Ziga at this point. Uh, John Ziga has over 22 years experience in banking. Um, he's currently the director of global markets for CBG. Um, he was the GM treasury of SY um, Sovereign Bank for almost three years. Uh, before he joined Sovereign Bank, he worked with ADB for six years in various capacities um, in the treasury function as head of treasury manager in charge of asset and liability management. Um, before he joined ADB, he also worked with Carl Bank for four years as deputy head of RICS management in charge of markets and liquidity RICS. Um, he actually started his career with Unilever um, in their treasury department as a treasury officer be between 1998 and 1999. He holds an MBA in financial management from University of Hull in the UK, a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from University of Ghana Business School. Um, we hold an LLB, Gimpa Law Faculty. He's a chartered banker, a chartered accountant, um, and is married with four children. Um, at this point, we want to also invite Mr. John Ziga to also give us his um, career and life journey, um, some dilemmas, and some advice for our young bankers. And when we are done with him, we'll now open up for uh, questions from everyone on the call. So, Mr. Ziga, if you can hear me, good evening and you are welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> and good evening to my colleagues. Um, I'll just, can you see my screen? Um, yes, it's uh, something is loaded. Yes, I can see. I can see now. Okay, so I'll just go straight to the point. Uh, it's a privilege to share with my colleagues. I wish I had this opportunity some years ago. I think my life would have been different from it is, it is today. Um, it's a privilege, as I said, to share with you colleagues 
um, my little life. It makes me, when you say share your life, Jenny, it looks like you are very, very old, but I don't think I'm that old. Um, but at least the little that I have to share, I would share uh, willingly with, 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 with other people as well, privileged as it is. Um, life is a journey with problems to solve and lessons to learn, but most of all, experiences to enjoy. In one's life, or in my life, Jenny, um, I've counted, encountered a lot of problems. I've encountered a lot of issues, which are lessons that I've learned, and some of them are experiences that I have enjoyed, some not so much, but it's all part of life. So I'll just go straight and um so can you see my slides? Yes, please. Yes, okay. Yes. So my yes, life journey, can. I will take it as a stream or as a river. Um, you know, the way the river the a river flows, it meanders. It gets to a certain point, it becomes very sharp. It gets to a certain point, it becomes very broad, depending on the obstacles that it meets on the way. The river will carve its way, depending on the strength of the rock that it meets. When the rock is very hard, you see it very narrow. When the terrain is very soft, you see it broad. And that is how my experience has been. And in most cases, it has meandered this way, um, not very straight. At every point in time, there are decisions to be made. So when you see one, two, three, I've, I've labeled them up to nine. And at every point in those nine stops, there have been decisions that have to be made. Some of them very difficult decisions, but they have to be made anyway. And that is how life is. When you wake up from bed till you go to uh, you go you come to work, you take about seven or eight decisions. You wake up in the morning, the water to bath, the you have to brush your teeth, you have to wash your, you have to bath, the shirt to wear, you have to make a decision the food to eat, you get out the road to take to get to the office. They are all decisions that you have to make at a point before you get to the office. And that is how life is. So journeying from number one, when I finished school in those days, we were so lucky. Um, I had to decide whether I wanted to be a banker or to continue with Unilever. I had opportunity to work with Unilever in their treasury department. And then we I heard that Stambik was about to start. Then I had some colleagues who told me about it. I said, well, I had to make a decision whether I should stay in Unilever or continue. I said, no, I wanted to be a banker. I applied and I got in, into Stambik. So we started with Stambik when it came in fresh. That's 1999. Worked with Stambik for some time. I said, okay, now that I'm into banking, what profession do I need to? I said, okay, ACIB, between ACIB and ACCA, which one should I take? I said, okay, let me take ACIB. I started the ACIB and within two years I chatted. I said, okay, now you have chatted with ACIB. I was with Stambik quite good, very young then, one of the youngest. After a year or two, I said, what next? Then, in, what is it? Uh, in University of Ghana Business School started an evening MBA program. Then we didn't have MBAs um, like schools in Ghana. So was in University of Ghana that started the first one. That was the executive MBA. And I was now torn between doing the executive MBA and doing the master's degree. 
I, I went for the executive. I was too young. I didn't have experience, so much experience. I just worked for two years. So I was saying, okay, I needed to go to school because my boss then advised me that you are very young. If you want to rely on money, you will not um, achieve much. So I said I needed to go back to school. And to do a, a full-time master's, that would mean I have to stop work and go and do a full-time master's. So it's not like now that people, you can do evening programs and stuff like that. It didn't exist. So I told myself that I had to resign. So I resigned from Stambik in 2002 when I've just chatted. My GM called me and asked, are you sure I make, you're making the right decision? I said, yes, that was a, that was a white guy, a white chap. Are you sure you're making the, white, the right decision? I said, yes. I'd saved a lot of money. And what my um, some of you should is that when we finished, three of us, myself and my other two colleagues who are also bankers now, we decided that we we're going to rent apartments together because we had just started work. I mean, there was no point. So I saved a lot of money. And that is what I used. I had um, admission to University of Hull. Then I paid my ticket and I went to Hull to do my master's. That was decision point three. After the master's program, I stayed on for about two years I said, oh, that place was boring. I needed to make a decision whether to come back to Ghana or to stay. My colleagues I went with said, oh, let's stay, let's stay, let's stay. I said, no, no, no. I was I was coming back home. Then I came back home. That was just af before the World Cup. That was the 2006, the World Cup 2006. After the World Cup, I said, OK, in that case, let me look for a job. Initially, the temptation was to go back to um, Stambik, but I felt that um, let me look for a new challenge. I looked for a new challenge, and Carl Bank then was the place to be. I was with Carl Bank for some time, and I learned a lot from Carl Bank. Uh, Frank was somebody that I respected so much. I remember one day I gathered the, the courage as a young guy, went to his office as MD, and I told him that I wanted to talk to him. He asked me, what was it about? So I just wanted to just, I asked him, Frank, what has made you who you are today? And he found that so interesting that a young guy of my age would, would dare come to his office and ask him this question. But he saw that was, it was out of bravery and out of wanting to know. So he sat me down and went through his life journey with me. And I picked a lot of lessons out of that. And that changed my life a whole lot. That encounter with him was a turning point in my life. And as I say, and I would say, at any point in time, I'm on, I'm on decision point four. At any point in my life, I ask myself, why are you here, brother? What is your career ambition? Why are you here? At any point in time, you stay in there for some time, I ask myself, why are you here? What are your career aspirations or what are your career ambitions? If at the point where I am, I think I'm not meeting my career ambitions, I look around to see whether I can make the next move. So from Carl Bank, I saw an opportunity in ADB when they were rebranding and they needed to revamp. I saw an opportunity and I jumped on it. Frank Edu was asking why I wanted to leave, but I said, oh, I think I wanted to change my, my career path. In Stambik, I was in Treasury, and I think I loved the Treasury work in Stambik. But when I went to Carl Bank, I was in risk management, which was also quite interesting and challenging. When I saw the opportunity in ADB to go back to Treasury, I thought that was a good opportunity for me. So I left to ADB in their Treasury um, 
function. And fortunately for me, or unfortunately for me, I used to have a, a junior in Stambik. And when I went to ADB, he was now my boss in ADB. And we worked so hard at ADB that we made a lot of changes in terms of treasury functions in ADB. If you would recollect, for those of you who would recollect, and Bank of Ghana was always on our case then, we were doing something that most people did not understand. This was uh, around 2010 when yields on bills were coming down so low. It came to a point that treasury bill rates were around 7%, 10%, sorry, 10%. They were around 15 and they were dropping, dropping, dropping. They came to 91 day bill came to 10%. So myself and my friend, my colleague, who, who now became my boss, Junior now became my boss, we sat down, we said that we had seen the trend. So what we we're going to do was to borrow long, invest in those bills. So we were always on the market borrowing. We wrote the paper to the board. The board members did not really understand what we were doing. So we borrowed short, invested in some long instruments, and that made a lot of money for the bank. But of course, we had risk management, of course, with my risk management background around it to unwind the position gradually. Bank of Ghana would always come with invest, uh, what is it? Yeah, investigations to find out why were you always borrowing ADB? And we'll always explain to them these are the things that we're doing. Fast forward, ADB and its issues. One day, I was home. That was in 2016. I think I had, I had gone on leave preparing for an exam. I wanted to do, I was then writing the ACCA, I think so, yes. And I had a call from a colleague. He said, ah, I've seen your name in the list of people who are being laid off redundancy. I said, what? So I quickly took my phone and checked, and yet my name was there among those who were going to be laid off as redundant. It was a very big blow for me. It turned my life around. So that's the second turning point in my life. Initially, I was very, very down. I spoke to mentors and they said, well, it's part of life. Fast forward. Sovereign Bank came in. We interviewed for Sovereign Bank. And they took me on as a GM for global markets or treasury to start the treasury function all over. We did what we could do for three years. Then in 2018, another issue happened. One nice morning we came to work and we're in the office and we had an announcement. Five banks had their licenses revoked and Sovereign was one of them. We started CBG. Fast forward. We interviewed, of course, there was competition, five or seven banks coming together with a balance sheet, seven different kinds of balance sheets coming together. You know, I was supposed to head the treasury function again, putting all these balance sheets together and the implications thereof in terms of liquidity, the implications thereof in terms of FX risk and stuff like that. But we're able to with the team around, we're able to put all this together. And today, 
I look back at what happened in those years and I just laugh. Yes, there were challenges. But with the help of colleagues, with the help of people that we looked up to, we were able to surmount some of those challenges. Challenges as they are will always come, issues will always come, but you have to find ways and means to overcome them. So some of those are some of the challenges I had and the key milestones are the ones that I had at ADB and also currently at CBG being able to put this together in terms of strict balance in management. In terms of professionalism, yes, I had some challenges, especially so at Calbank. Issues would come up and I remember this one very clearly. And it's one of the reasons why I left there. It, it got, got to a point that you had to be challenged between loyalty and professionalism, which one you had to choose. Loyalty and professionalism. There are key things that you have to, 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 to be loyal to somebody or to be a professional. I think I chose professionalism and I left. Work balance. I love football, just as uh, my colleague also said, I love football. And my team has always been Arsenal and Hearts of Oak. Arsenal because I just love the way they play their football. Ethical issues. Yes, as for ethical issues, they will always be there. One of them, as I said, professionalism and, and loyalty. You would face those things at different times in your life. And what my boss used to tell me is that, especially so on the market, in the markets that I deal in, in terms of um, treasury market, the same people who would come to you giving you money whether you are in credit, you are in audit, you are wherever, are the same people who go around to tell other people that I gave this person money, I gave this person money, I gave this person money. So you just have to be on the lookout to decide what you want to do, whether you want to be a professional or you don't want to be. Because when you take the money, people will get to know you anyway, because the same people, the market is so small. The same people who go out and say, oh, this guy, this guy is, this guy, this guy is. And the ethical issues, you would face them. You would get to a point, you see that there are loopholes in the systems and you want to take advantage of them, but you would finally be found out. As for that one, Tama will always come to play. You would be, fi be found out. So in terms of professional, in terms of ethical challenges, I think time is fast spent. I wouldn't... Um, say much these are some of the challenges and these are how i've been able to get around some of them i wouldn't say they have been rosy of course we've had ups and downs low moments and high moments but we have maneuvered and come this far i always tell my colleagues here that if me i've been able to do it if you knew my background if you know where i'm coming from i'm a first generation uh, what is it, a uh, graduate in my village, not my, my family, my whole village. If you can just imagine, you go to school and some people, their fathers are professors, their fathers are doctors, and you are a first generation graduate from your village. If I've been able to do it, I tell my colleagues, most of you are far more better placed to do exceedingly above what some of us have done. Just stay focused. Don't think that it will come easy. And don't see people and say, oh, this person has this. I also need this. You don't know how the person got it. They had to bid their time. Bid your time. Learn, learn, learn. And it will be your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much. Um, that was a powerful presentation. Um, a lot of nuggets. 
from the presentation. Beatrice, Beatrice, can you please mute yourself? Okay, thank you once again, John, for um, sharing your career with us. Um, at this point, we want to open up to our members um, on the call. Uh, please, if you have any question you want to ask um, either John or Sina, you can uh, raise your hand. Um, I'll call you for you to come in. Because of our time, let's try and make the questions very short, maybe one question. Um, if you also want to use the chat box, you can also use the chat box for the question. So I see a first hand, Edward. Edward, if you can hear me, please unmute and um, come forward with your question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And then thank you. First of all, let me say good evening to my colleagues on the call and my seniors. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the session. I think it's been very insightful. I don't have a question to add, but just to say thank you to the uh, seniors that share their insights on their career. But there's one thing that Sena said. I mean, for Sena, it felt like one of our evening lectures. So kind of used to it. But I think that um, he said something that really hits me. And I maybe want to reiterate that. That you don't follow once you have a career path that we want to achieve. Money should not be the determining factor. Pursue that cause and the money will realign himself. And there's one thing that he also said that um, he acknowledged the supreme being that has come this far just by grace. So what I take the fact that I need to be focused on what I want to achieve and not follow money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward, for um, your comments. Um, I also picked same from Sina uh, when he was making his submission, reliance on God and not focusing so much on materialism. Thank you very much. Um, please, the floor is open. So if you want to ask a question or you want to make a contribution, you can uh, put your hand up. I'll call you for you to ask your question. Uh, this is a good time with our seniors. So please, let's ask all the questions bothering us in terms of our career. Um, issues relating to ethical dilemmas, please, let, let's let's ask the question. So let's open up and ask the question. If you want to ask the question, please, um, you can you can raise your hand and I'll call you for you to ask your question. Uh, whilst we wait for questions, um, Sina and um, John, I don't know if you have some uh, few um, leftovers that you want to give to us in terms of the areas that you mentioned. Maybe there's something that has cropped up as the session is ongoing that you want to chip in whilst we wait for a uh, question from our audience. So Sina and uh, John, any of you can, can come in. Okay, so just to say that in terms of the profession that we have chosen for ourselves, and uh, just as Sina saying, whichever profession you have chosen, which is banking, um, you stay focused. Nothing would come so easy. There is no easy way. There is no easy way. Focus on whatever you want to do. Learn as much as you can. And progress. You see, if it is not working for you and there is the need to change course, don't be afraid to change course. Don't be afraid. Of course, the challenges will come. That's what the challenges will come. As Senna said, he started from somewhere, moved to somewhere, moved to somewhere. The challenges will come, and if it means that you have to change course, so be it and stay focused. That's it. That's all that I just want to say. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, I see an app, so I will pick that. Then I'll, I'll ask a, a question that I, I put down while Senna was making submissions. So, you see, if I think I see your hand up. I don't know if you want to ask a question. Okay, okay so the hand. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, good evening to you all, and thank you to. Hello, Yusuf. Your line has dropped. Uh, John, uh, if you are speaking, we can't hear you. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Can yes, we me? can hear you now, please. Yeah, all right. Sorry. Um, I was. 
two presenters for having doing this with us. My own is an ask for our chartered members, our chartered bankers. I know the ability to sit in high level meetings. And so one of the things that we come across during our presentations at the various banks to encourage people to become chartered bankers is the value in terms of recognition and then uh, promotion. I just want to put it before our two senior members. Uh, if they can share with our uh, Hello, Yusuf, your line is not too stable at all. Um, it comes and it goes. I think I get the import of Yusuf's uh, question. Eh? Question, okay. Then please, yeah. you can let go me, ahead with the me, answer. Yes, please. Let me try. So Yusuf so is I, trying to... I don't know if you had my last part of my question. Yes, Yusuf, you were asking uh, that in your presentation, outreach presentation, the most popular question has been, what happens to me if I complete CIB? Will it give me a guaranteed position? I guess that's what you are trying to uh, uh, access, right? Yeah, exactly. And those who are currently on it, how did they get noticed so that they can get uh, uh, um, the value that they deserve for themselves and for the banks that they work with? Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, because of my, I have a lot of people who tell me that I am too modest. Uh, because even when I have to take the recognition, I tend to default it to the blessings of God. But of course, um, I am a believer. And God says that we should appreciate. And so uh, if you come to my office, I have um, an Arabic writing there, which translated to English as which of the blessings of your Lord would you deny? And I obviously I can't deny any of the blessings of God. And that's how I come back. If I if I make that a constant, because God says he's Arahman Arahim, so that becomes a constant. Uh, the certificate alone cannot give you the position. What a certificate can do for you is to open the door as to whether you would have a seat in the room is dependent on what you have to provide or what you have to offer. And so as you go through this course, one of the things you need to know is that don't just come to CIB because of the certificate, but come because you are seeking knowledge and that when the door is open, you would justify and sit in the room. And you see, confidence is key. You have had this session and opportunity has been given for people to ask questions. I can assure you that there are people here who have questions to ask, but the confidence to do that. But let's face it, you cannot sit in the dark and frown your face and expect a response. I mean, you go and sit in a dark room, you say you are angry and you frown your face. You are the only one who knows what you are doing. And so if you have the certificate and you can't let the value come out, no employer would give you opportunity because you have a certificate. But a certificate would open the door for you. And I can tell you, I have done a lot of professional courses. I have done ACI which is a foreign course. And I know my colleague uh, Ziga, who has always been in treasury, has also done it. I have done CA. I have done CIB. I have done CISA. But today I'm telling you that I have, of all these courses, I haven't seen a course that is as total as what I did in ACIB. And that is how come I align myself so much with ACIB. Is a total course. If you if you actually went through the course and not the course passing through you and take the course seriously, any door that is open for you, you will not walk out of the door without getting a seat in that room. And so that is what I have uh, to, to tell colleagues on that.
Thank you very much, um, Sina. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful response. I see three hands up. I see, let me start with uh, Robert. I see you. I see your hand up. I think you want to come in. Please come in at this point. Thank you. Sure. So um, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Sina and John. Um, I'm just pivoting from what Sina said that this program has been organized for us CIB um, uh, professionals. In, in my, and, no, and people are not asking questions, are not engaging enough. In my career journey, and I've worked in different markets, London, Edinburgh, Nigeria, and, and Ghana, and other West African countries, Again, the point Sina makes is, is you cannot you cannot not engage if that makes sense. You must bring your presence to the table. And see, I know very senior members of the institute, fellows, who tell me when they go to meetings, ACIBs don't talk. And sometimes when we talk, we actually come across as complaining or criticizing. And no executive wants someone who can talk first of all, can't communicate. Second is, uh, comes across uh, as complaining. And that's the spirit within which we are organizing events like this. Of course, this is a virtual environment. Ask questions. Questions are the answers. There's a book that I read many years ago. That's the title. Questions are the answers. Uh, it's written by Alan Peace. Alan Peace. Questions are the answers. But let me ask my question. Um, so uh, to to Sina, we we've had some engagements, and I see the progress and transformation you are bringing to uh, the retail banking uh, business in GCB Bank. I know you've. Um, you know, attended a number of programs outside of the country. What, what is the future of retail banking? Um, if, if we were to do some back from the future thinking five years from now, 10 years from now, what would banking generally look like and what would retail banking look like, particularly if you situate it in the context of all the disruptions and technology impact that we see? And of course, demographic shifts that we are seeing. So that's to Sina. Um, to John, um, it must be a really tough job managing the treasury function of a bank in all the volatilities that we've seen. Um, my question to you is, uh, what's the next big volatility around the corner? Um, and how do we prepare for it? <laughs> no, you know, so... We know we face a lot of unknowns, but as from a treasury perspective, how do you keep going? Because you can collapse the bank from the treasury, and and you've done a good job, uh, you know, uh, just listening to your career. Uh, that's that's your core. And you've gone through different volatilities, uh, from COVID, banking sector cleanup, DDEP. I just want to get a sense of maybe your experience, but how are you using that experience to predict what, what's, what's, what's coming next? Certainly something will come just that we don't know what it is. Thanks. I guess senior will go first. I guess senior will go first, oh? Senior Jiga will go first. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so, John. <laughs> yeah. okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, CEO, for, for the question. Um, what is the next volatility? Uh, before we had the DDEP, let me be very honest with you. I had the opportunity of um, sitting with some World Bank chaps from, from New York who came around and were having a meeting and they looked at my balance sheet and they were asking me questions, some questions in terms of <clears throat> the amount of Govies I had on my instrument, my balance sheet, and how I was managing them. So I gave them, and they were so impressed how I was managing them. And one small, one young chap asked me, "Have I modeled a probability of default 
on 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 the bonds that I'm holding. Uh, I was shocked that that young guy from the World Bank asked me that question. I was like, oh, these are government of Ghana instruments. And in my whole life, I haven't seen any default on that. So um, I haven't modeled any probabilities of default on that. Fast forward, we all saw what happened. So I always sit down and look and say, ah, but this guy asked me this question. I remember very well he asked me this question and I answered this question. So what is the next volatility? The volatility I see is a volatility of confidence. How I can model that volatility of confidence is what I'm still researching on because the market now On the horizon, what we see is confidence, how we can have confidence in our own market. So that is the next thing um, we are looking at, not um, what is it, interest rates or FX. Yes, the FX and all those things, we see them, they are seasonal, they come and go, they try to manage them. But what we see and how it's so difficult to manage is the confidence. Once we are able to get this confidence back in the economy, we think that things would 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 would, would take shape. So that is one thing that we and we are the next volatility that we are all looking at. How we can streamline the volatility confidence confidence of the volatility of confidence in our economy. So we see you, if you ask me what is the next volatility that I'm looking at, that is what I'm looking at, confidence, and how to model that um, in whatever facet, in, whether in the FX or in the money market space, interest rate, whatever it is. That is a key thing that my hands are on, and we are seeing how best we can, we can look at that. If there are any factors, that we can we we can use to model that is what we are all looking at. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very um, much, Robert. John, Robert, to, to yeah, to please. Your so now you can continue, please. Uh, first of all, uh, a conversation around retail banking from a global front can be very very deceptive, and I think we should all understand. If you ask me in terms of maturity of retail banking in the um, euro and then the US of A, um, the gap is about uh, 10 years apart in terms of the maturity. And so uh, I wouldn't attempt to answer from a global front, but more importantly in Africa. And I'll start from. Um, um, what um, um, was was uh, this guy? This guy uh, is it Steve Jobs? Is it Steve Jobs who says uh, who said so many years ago that uh, banks may not be needed, but banking services would be required uh, in future, and that future is actually here. And for retail banking, even the conversation is a lot more difficult than um, wholesale banking. Because retail banking, let's face it, if you receive your salary today, um, um, and Robert, the next thing that comes in your mind is how to use the salary. And so given that retail focuses on personal banking and the lower end of the, uh, of the business that is micro and small, if you want to pick the retail, the personal banking side of, of, of things. Convenience, reliability, responsiveness are the key words that is going to shape the future. More importantly, all this must be carved around digital inclusion. Because in the next five years, we are going to transition 
the kind of professionals you are going to have for uh, as our customers will be entirely different. All the people who like to come to the banking hall to meet their colleagues, pensioners are gradually leaving the chain. And so just look at the, um, the, the lifespan and what uh, my colleague John uh, shared, an interesting life stages, the life cycle of a typical human being from baby till retirement. What kind of solutions are you providing for each of these people? And how are you providing the solution? Are you considering digital inclusion? Any retail banker who in five years wants to rely on interest income to run the retail business will be out of business. Because customers are getting wiser. Now there is embedded finance. There is buy now, pay later. There is travel now, pay later. Save now, travel later. And all these embedded finance are happening on, on phones. They are happening on digital channels. And so the reason why I will come for a loan, if it's to go and now buy a television, there is an embedded finance that would take care of me. And so retail banking in the next five years, forget about interest income. It's going to be a lot about fees. It's going to be about commissions. It's going to be about services and getting uh, 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 revenue from uh, services. And all this must happen on a state-of-the-art technology platform. They use your app today, no response. They switch to another app and you are out of business. Open banking is gaining grounds where you are going to have bank as a service. They call it BAS, bank as a service, where banks are all going to be connected into what looks like an omni-channel. I tap here, I get what I want from GCB, I get what I want from Access. I get what I want from Bank of uh, Africa. I get what I want from CBG. I don't actually need to have a bank account. And that is where retail banking is going in the future. And so that is what my transformation agenda is focusing on. I want to prepare my bank for the future. And for me, every single day, it's a representation of the previous day's future. And so we are driving and making the right investment in our people, making the right investment in our systems, and more importantly, making the right investment for our customers, because we are here to serve the customers. Remember, he who solved the customer's problem gets the customer's money. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sina, um, for explaining the future that we see for retail banking. Um, I see four hands up. Um, I, I want to ask that if we could extend the session for additional maybe 10, 15 minutes so that we can take our questions at this point. But I see four hands up and I don't want anyone to leave here with a question not answered. So let me take the first question from uh, Florence Yabua. Florence, if you can hear me. Please, um, we can go ahead with your question. Can you unmute and speak? Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. Yeah, good evening, Florence. Okay. Uh, please, I want to ask uh, Sina a question. Uh, when he was uh, making his presentation, he said that uh, we need to get mentors. Mentors. Uh, I want to find out at my level, if I see a senior colleague that uh, I want to look up to, how how do I go about it? How do I approach the person? Thank you. Okay, so look, if you want to look for a sponsor or a coach in life, there are two things that can get you attracted to a sponsor. And the two things are, your performance currency and your relationship currency. And so if it's within the organization, ask yourself, am I attractive enough? And the way you'll be attractive is to go 
through the performance route, or if it's about a relationship, you go to that sponsor, either you are calling the person, you go to the person's office, and the conversation goes like, sir, I have been observing you for the past years, and I am impressed by the way you do things. I would want to shape my future around your professionalism. Would you be kind enough to take me as your mentee or as your coachee? Very simple conversation. And that is how you go. But mind you, if you are coming to me, Sina, I will interview you. And if your attitude is not worth somebody I need to spend my expensive time on, I'll not do it. And so before you go, the question is, what do you have to offer? Because even the person you are appointing as your sponsor or your coach also wants to feel proud one day and say that, there go my, my, my mentee, there go my coachee. And so it should be a quid pro quo. What you take is the attitude and what you get is the direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sina. Thank um, you. We'll take the thank you. We'll take the next one from Jonathan. Jonathan Komi. Jonathan, if you can hear me, please um you can go ahead with your question. Thank you, Patrick. A very good evening to my seniors and colleagues. So my question relates to a comment that uh, I've been thinking about for a while now. For me, going through the CIB program was one of the, I think the best knowledge acquisition journeys that I had. I, I saw the um Jonathan, I think your your line has been muted. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. So um I don't know which point at which point I went off. No, I think it just went off when you started. So if you can just just take it again. Oh, okay. So um, I said a good evening to my seniors and colleagues, and I was sharing my personal CIB journey and the the currency I gained after the CIB program and how I was able to transfer it into my work. Now, what I've I'm in the regulatory space. I've been there for almost some nine years now, and one of the things I have observed. Whilst uh, implementing regulation across about two banks for now is, is this. You know, I've cited instances where at least John is here, Sena is here. When you need to be in the treasury space, the regulation requires you to be doing ACI. When you need to be an auditor of an institution, minimum requirement is a CA. Now, I also know that some for some other professions to like being a lawyer, you need to do LLB and BL. For me, I've always asked, maybe I may not understand the, the, the whole ecosphere, but what I keep wondering about is my thoughts are with the fact that can we make it such that for certain levels in the banking space a minimum requirement should be having a cib a cib qualification i know the institute has gone a very long way to do executive programs and stuff like that i think that should be a basis and i always say that like look there are there are instances where yes it may not be every lawyer that is good but at least once that space is reserved for that person he is able to hone his skills and mature into into the space i don't know if the institute to look at that i was going to ask a question about mentorship but unfortunately i missed Sinai's first uh, presentation and i i noticed from what florence asked it means that he he's done a good job about it but if the institute can also has mentorship programs i'm wondering thank you Okay, so Patrick, do you mind if I take that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So 
that's that's a very good observation eh? um, in terms of the ACIB um, acceptance and if you like legislation around this so that you must have it to occupy certain positions. The first thing is that we are pursuing that. Uh, and we are pursuing that in different ways. Um, I can tell you confidently or confidentially, well, maybe if I say it on this call, there is no, no longer confidential. We've uh, engaged, um, there's a whole team set up by council that's engaged in different stakeholders on that. The second part is there's a committee working on um, really looking at even the act of Parliament that we have today and saying, are there things that we could put in the that will make certain things mandatory? So that's that's one part. I do know that I think in this country it, it feels like there must be some compliance requirement for us to do what the right thing is. So if you get to the traffic light, there's no police officer who will jump it. The only reason we'll slow down is because there's someone watching. But should that be the case? You know the value of this program. You know, how do we sell ourselves? Because I know that whatever you impose on people, people will oppose it. So from a strategy perspective, whilst we are working on the regulatory engagement and even looking at the act side, the best product, the best solution, if you like, assuming that ACIB is a product, is those who hold the qualification today and those who held it before and those who will hold it in the future. What is it that we bring around the table? Because if I know that Sina has something and that's what takes him to the levels that he's going to, I will look for that thing. You know, so there, there are different ways we can skin this cut. One is to take the regulatory compliance, make it compulsory. Um, but the other side is we must create value. And that value comes from different perspectives, those who hold the qualification, but what the Institute also must do. For a long time, you will notice that the content of our curriculum, um, perhaps you know, hasn't been updated for many years. You know that we've redesigned the curriculum to make it more relevant, more future focused, more, um, you know, if you like, focus on the key competences around digital, around core banking skills, around ethics and professionalism, sustainability. And those are the things that are key, digital, AI. Those are key things that, as a banker, if you must have a voice around the table, you must have. So we are addressing that. The other thing is that the people will give you the opportunity. And, and that's why we are really keen to create this community of bankers uh, across the chapters. And I really encourage you to be active in your chapters and also in the Institute's Affairs. Because if Sina knows that you are a chartered banker worth your sort, that you didn't just go through the ACIB, the course has gone through you. I'm sure that if there are opportunities and you come before the before him in an interview, um, you you there, there's there's a, a, a certain commonality that will work for you. But that's one side. You may not meet Sina. There are a number of people in key management positions today who don't have the qualification, and so the approach is. If we can get those people from the institute perspective to become chartered bankers, then of course they know the content of what you have, they will begin to appreciate it. So I'm taking the conversation beyond compliance to value, to relevance, to people knowing about the content and what the ACIB is able to deliver for them. Um, so a long speech, but I'm saying that there are different things that we're all doing. You must do your part in your bank, brighten the corner where you are. Let people know that you are a chartered banker. Of course, council will do the regulatory side. I and my team, you know, Patrick and others, will continue to drive the visibility agenda and the market acceptability, the mind share 
of, of the program, but we all have to chip in. And whatever you impose on people, chances are that people will oppose it. Of course, you can argue that the lawyers, the accountants and all that, um, maybe we miss the bus at some point. We'll have to um, catch up. And that catch up requires all of us doubling up. It's like there was no traffic light. Drivers drove through, i.e. everybody entered banking without the banking qualification. You can't put a traffic light behind them and say they should all come back. You'd have to find a way of catching up with them. And, and that's what we are very clear at the Institute, um, you know, that we need to do and we are doing. But we count on you. A number of us ACIBs don't participate in the Institute's affairs. We don't get involved in making our voices heard. And, and I can go on and on, but simple answer to your question is there are different things we are doing to address that. Uh, Sina is a council member, uh, uh, and of course, John, a very senior person as well. Uh, you, you can also add a few more to that. Uh, Patrick, I hope I've answered the question. Was there a second part to this? No, I, I think you, you, you've you captured all the, the, the angles of the the question. I don't know if Sina or John want to add something to that before we pick the last question. So John and Sina, I don't know if you want to add anything to what you have said concerning the question that was asked by Jonathan. Okay, so um, I think in my in my presentation or somebody asked that uh, question, Yusuf, actually Yusuf asked that question and the point I made, which I'll still make is that uh, today, if you are an employer, are you looking for certificate or you are looking for value? So your certificate would get you shortlisted. But if you get into the assessment room, do you have what it takes to get a seat at the table? And look, the way the world is going, I can assure you that if you sleep for one day without reading anything new, you are already uh, getting rusty. And so one, from a policy point of view, if you have influence, we'll get there. And that is why we should all pray that our seniors will get into the position. Imagine what somebody like me can do if I become the governor of Bank of Ghana or even the deputy governor around CIB the conversation becomes very easy. Robert may not even come to my office. We'll just write a, 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 a memo and, and tell me, so now I want you to read this memo in your next uh, uh, press conference. And in the middle of that memo or circular would be going forward to get into a branch manager position, you should be an ACIB holder. And those who are already branch managers, I have given you three years to regularize, else you may have to uh, uh, change rule. Just that little statement, and CIB is already a hit. But if I made that statement, let's ask ourselves, do we have what it takes to justify that call? That is the biggest question we should all answer uh, in this engagement. Have you prepared yourself enough such that if tomorrow you are called to go and sit in a branch as a sales lead, can you do it? And so it's not just about the certificate, the value behind the certificate. Prepare yourself for the rainy day. Else it will rain the whole day and you won't have the bucket to collect water. After the rains, you have to go and rely on somebody to get small water to wash your face. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Sina. Uh, John, do you want to add uh, something to this uh, topic? Uh, just very little, actually. I think they've said, uh, CEO and Sina have said it all, value behind it. So when I'm, when, for example, I'm doing recruitment, shortlisting, of course, there are, criteria that I will look out for. You have the degree, you have this, you have that, you have ACI, that's the minimum. So that steves some people out. 
but the value that you bring on board is what matters. So just as Senna said, prepare yourself, have it for the rainy day. You never know. But that alone is not a guarantee. It is the value that you exude, the value that you are coming to add to it. That the certificate will give you the stepping stone, but it is the value. Don't look at the certificate alone and say, well, because I have the certificate, I must be this. No, it doesn't work that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, John, um, for adding your voice to uh, this important topic. I think we'll take our last question from Emmanuel Atto. Atto's hand has been up for some time now. So, Emmanuel, if you can hear me, uh, please unmute and, and go ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, and good evening to, to all. And thank you to Athena, Sina, and John for sharing an insightful presentation. Um, just a quick question um, on the ethical dilemma. Uh, in terms of the loyalty and professionalism, <clears throat> is there a way we can balance that? Because in all, the, in, in all your, I mean, presentation, I mean, it's all about picking the professionalism. But is there a way we can blend loyalty and professionalism? Or in all cases, is this professionalism? Maybe you could throw light on that. It has seen our job. Thank you. Yeah, let me let, let me come that from my experience, from, from, my, from a very interesting experience I had at Calbank. You 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 really, really have to balance the two. Okay. So depending on who you speak to, some people will tell you that. They would always, my my former boss would give would give you an article. You say oh, the 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 loyalty of a dog. He says that he can't work with anybody who is not loyal. And from some perspective, I agree with him hundred percent. Okay. But you would have to be loyal, but not a blind loyal uh, person loyalty with professionalism because the thing is if i'm working with the md and the md cannot trust me there's no way i can work with him there's no way i can work with him at a certain stage at a certain managerial state and even your boss if you're working with your boss and your boss does not trust you there's no way you will and work with that person. Okay, so loyalty and professionalism. Now, when the two conflict, it gets to a certain point that the two conflict, you have to make a choice. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, I see a final hand up. Edward, Edward, please come in uh, with your question or contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So I just wanted to go back to um, when John was speaking on the question that um, Robert asked on the what's the next big thing that we should expect. So I just want to have a better understanding of what this answer respect to the volatility of um, confidence. Is it confidence from um, let me put it, is it confidence within the bank industry where people will lose confidence or are we exhibiting confidence in our job roles? So confidence, to... so, so depend on where you take the confidence from. I, I was looking at confidence in terms of as a country, okay? I can okay. cascade down, down to confidence when it comes to your own rule and confidence just as uh, my colleague was saying how confident you are in terms of approaching who you are supposed to so for me i see confidence as the next crisis because the thing is in my interaction with some market players the thing is or with some investors i'm selling the product to somebody and the person says that oh especially so for example in government bill, uh, instruments the person is not confident to buy. 
Why is he not confident? Because his experience, the confidence in my currency. Why don't I have confidence in my currency? And that I want to, when I'm get paid my salary, I want to convert it into dollars or sterling or euro. Why don't I have confidence in the work that I'm doing? So the crisis of confidence, that's what I'm saying, the volatility of confidence, where we are as a nation, if that confidence does not come back, the market perspective of where I'm, I'm looking at it from the work that I'm doing, I see it as the next thing that we need to, the next hurdle that we need to cross over. Of course, it's an election year, it's an election period. What level of confidence do we have as a nation, as a people? And it all, all these things would have effect in one way or the other. Getting to December, you see people buying tickets and leaving the country. What is the level of confidence? Okay, I get it. I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, I see Sinner's hand up. So I think Sinner wants to add up. Just to add to the conversation, <laughs> uh, energy, uh, the, where is this disruption coming from? Yeah, so, uh, Eddie, first of all, let's ask us ourselves where all our troubles started as a country. Our troubles started in, I think, 2001, or was it 2002, when we went to the capital market to raise funding and our bonds we issued were woefully and are subscribed and we're not successful. That is when all this conversation about the domestic debt exchange program started. And so when John talks about the battle for confidence, John talks about the fact that as a country, we need to rewrite our story post the IMF program what is the situation going to look like are we winning the confidence because there's a big brother around who has a stake on the managers of our fiscal policy to comply with certain things as for the volatilities in interest the treasury guys have uh, their expertise in making money even during times of interest rate volatilities and john in his presentation mentioned the, the, the kind of inroads they made when interest rates were vo uh, volatile. And so confidence volatility is a serious canker that doesn't have a solution. And that's why if you listen to his presentation, he mentioned that he doesn't even know how we are going to model that one out. But that's what we are facing. And so as a country, if we can win back our confidence, on the capital market, maybe that will be the beginning of all the reversals that we are so much in need of. And everything starts from the capital market because they are interconnected. If you miss out on the capital market, be ready for your exchange rate market to, to misbehave. Be ready for your money market to misbehave because then your major sources of long dated funding are blocked. You need to rely on short-term instruments, which by themselves are not so reliable. And so that's the kind of confidence we should work to restore. Uh, that's what I, I have to add. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And I think um, on that note, we want to take the final remarks of our guest um, this evening. So we'll start with um, John, and then we'll end with Sina. Then we we'll invite um, CEO to give his uh, closing remarks before we leave the call. So John, if you can give us your closing remarks, um, then we'll move to Sina. Thank you. 
So as closing remarks, I want to say a very big thank you to the organizers, the Institute, um, CEO, and your team for this opportunity. I wish um, <clears throat> I had this opportunity when I was a young banker, but those of us who have had the opportunity, I think it's something that we should grasp and learn as much as we can. And just as um, um, my other colleague Senna said, it's an opportunity for us to interact. If it was even face to face, that would have even been better. And just as you also said, you get opportunity to meet a lot more people, and the relationship or the relational currency that was talked about, you create it from the people you interact with. You learn a lot. People share their experiences when you also get there. And you say, "Ah, this person." I I heard this person say so, and this was how the person maneuvered. So when you meet those challenges, you would find a way out. I wish all of us the best, and see you. I think we should continue with these things. It will help a lot more people, especially so the young ones, to find their feet. And at these times, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John um, Sina. Uh, thank you very much, um, um, CEO and the team for putting uh, this together. As my colleague has mentioned, let's uh, look out for an opportunity to have some of these sessions uh, in person. And and I know you are doing you are doing these things as part of your uh, CPDs. But what I've realized uh, on uh, in this part of our work is that things you make free, people don't really uh, value, and so. Just look at how you can uh, monetize this thing. I mean, this is two hours of John and my good self time. And if I look at the numbers we have here, the numbers of people who are asking that we make uh, ACIB a default, uh, a, a great a qualifier, in just 91 at a point who are a little over 100. And so maybe if we monetize this one, people will take it serious. But but these lessons, if you go to business schools all over the place, these lessons, people come and and and, and it benefits the, the, the professionals who make the, the time. And I want to say that let us not end it here. Colleagues, I mean, if you have any dilemmas you have to deal with, the CIB, because you are a member, should be your first point of contact. Talk to the CEO. If the CEO doesn't have the answers, he has a whole lot of uh, people he can engage and, and and find new solutions. Let's create CIB as one big family and, and work together to the point where CIB becomes a major fit and proper decider. And uh, once again, thank you for this opportunity and enjoy your weekend. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Sina. Thank you very much. Bye John. bye. Uh, so we'll hand over Patrick, to uh, CEO to give his final. Yes, to make his final remarks before we, we leave the call. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start from where I started, from, which is a big thank you to Sina and to John and, and to all of you who joined the session. I, I do not want to go over all the things that have been said. I think we all heard them. Um, there's a bit around the mentorship that I think I missed. Uh, someone asked that. We've actually started a mentorship program. And guess what? The chartered bankers, uh, the executive, those on the executive leadership program, we've actually assigned them two mentees each. But do you know that we struggled to get ACIBs, people on this call, to actually apply for those mentorship? And by the way, a number of those people are <clears throat> directors in various banks. Some are working at Bank of Ghana. What a privilege to be mentored by people like that. So the opportunity is available. We are having the second cohort of the Chartered Banker for Executive Leadership. Please apply to be a mentee. And, and is the, the, <laughs> as an institute, we can do that. 
it's up to you. Um, but again, for those who joined this call this evening, uh, thank you for making the time. This constitutes part of your CPD, so please log same. Um, and I hope that, sincerely, I hope that you had something uh, today that would shape and, and uh, accelerate your career. Uh, once again, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick, Yusuf, and all the others who put this together. As an institute, we'll continue to do what we do best. Give us feedback. We are not perfect. Give us feedback in terms of the things that we can do to make the institute what we can all be proud of. On that note, please enjoy your weekend and keep safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, just OK. Thank you. It's a good one.